Hello, my name is Linda Vita. I'm the director of the Water Resources Center Archives. And we're the uh, main sponsor of the colloquium series. And tonight we have a great speaker. I just have a few quick announcements. We do have a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. If you are not currently getting reminder emails about the lecture series, please sign that list. And we send out a reminder about two weeks prior to the lecture. And we do have some literature about the archives. If you'd like to take any, it has our contact information on it. And also, we videotape each lecture, and we post them on the website about two weeks after the, each lecture so that um, if you know someone who was not able to be here, you can let them know. And with that, I'd like to introduce Professor Michael Hanneman, who is on the colloquium committee. And he will introduce the speaker for this evening. Well, it gives me a very great personal pleasure to introduce Gary Wolf. You know, uh, historians, among historians, uh, there's a, a concept referred to as the Whig view of history, which is the notion that history over time is a steady progression, a steady improvement. And uh, one could argue that Gary's uh, career uh, exemplifies and supports the Whig view of history. Gary uh, started off as an environmental engineer and then decided uh, he wanted to become an economist. And he did his master's degree at Stanford in environmental engineering, and then decided to come to Berkeley to do a PhD. What finer example of the Whig view of history. Uh, Gary uh, practiced as an environmental engineer uh, for a number of years after uh, graduating with his master's degree from Stanford and then uh, had his uh, epiphany about becoming an economist and came to our PhD program in agricultural and resource economics and did his PhD with me in a very nice, uh, very fine dissertation on the theory of environmental taxation. Uh, he held a postdoc at Stanford uh, and then went to work for the Pacific Institute where he was a senior economist uh, and senior engineer and worked on a number of well-known studies, including studies of uh, uh, salinity, the economics of salinity, and agricultural conservation, and uh, many others. He was uh, appointed to the Regional Water Quality Board for the Bay Area, and then was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger to the State Water Board uh, 2006, and um, then was made Vice Chair of the State Water Board. Um, I want to emphasize that Gary has always been very sharp, uh, very grounded in reality. Uh, and uh, while I'm delighted that he's following my example and wearing a tie, I don't uh, claim any credit for Gary's many accomplishments. Welcome, Gary Wolf. Thank you, Michael. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Michael. How's that going to work? Feedback? More feedback? Can you hear me? We didn't burn it out. OK. That was a wonderful introduction. I greatly appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I often find when I make presentations that the introduction is the high point. And so I may defeat uh, Michael's theory of history here with the presentation. We will, we will see. I was saying to Mike Connor from SFEI and Diane White from our uh, San Francisco Bay Regional Board just before the, the presentation that I finished this at 9 p.m. last night. Um, and I put the presentation together specifically in response to this invitation to speak because I realized I've been on the state board for two years and this was a good time for me to reflect and to think about uh, what makes us successful, what causes us to fail, and how we can do better in the future. I've certainly thought about those things uh, in pieces over time, but this was the first time I sat down and tried to sum it up. And you're about to see the first effort along those lines. I haven't dry run the presentation. Uh, this was, I say, completed last night. So it may not be as crisp as I would like, but I think the basic ideas will come through. And I greatly appreciate your feedback during the question and answer period. I titled this Successes and Failures in California Water Regulation. And I have to make a disclaimer up front. These are my personal opinions. I don't speak for the board or the staff. No, no board member does. And this is work in progress. The dialogue that we're about to have today is very real and ongoing. If you're wondering what this picture is, I'm not going to tell you. 
I just thought that this was my opportunity to do what professors at Berkeley and other places often do, which is to leave it as an exercise for the students. <laughs> <coughs> Topics for today, who we are, what we do, my criteria for success and failure, some success stories, some failures to date, and where to from here. Well, we're a 1,600-person state bureaucracy governed by nine regional water quality control boards and one state water resources control board. There are 81 regional board positions, nine on each of the nine boards. They're essentially unpaid. You're given $100 per meeting, which turns into $91 after they remove the mandatory retirement contribution. <coughs> there are five state board positions. They are paid full time. All board members are appointed by the governor. Both regional and state board members are appointed by the governor, subject to confirmation by the state senate, and serve four-year terms. There's an annual budget this year of about $834 million. I'm going to show you the regional uh, board boundaries on the next page. And if you're interested more in what we do, this is our, uh, our URL. These are the uh, nine regions. We're in the San Francisco Bay region now, region two. I like to say that uh, <clears throat> some regions are more equal than others. And region two is, in my opinion, more equal than others. I'm also the liaison for region three. And then we have Los Angeles, Santa Ana, San Diego, Colorado River, La Hontan, Central Valley, our biggest region. Just north, going north of Sacramento, that half of the region is, I'm told, bigger than the state of Indiana. <clears throat> I heard that recently. And of course, the North Coast region. The regions are based on watershed boundaries. Each region is not a single watershed, but they're, to the extent possible, built around watersheds. So for example, in the San Francisco Bay region, <clears throat> there are some coastal watersheds down here and up here. Uh, that don't drain through the Golden Gate, but the rest of the region drains through the Golden Gate. All the Central Valley region drains uh, through the Delta and eventually through the Golden Gate um, and so forth. The coastal regions tend to have more separate watersheds draining directly to the ocean. <clears throat> Our mission is to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of California's water resources and to ensure their proper allocation and efficient use for the benefit of present and future generations. A truly noble goal. Our legal authority <clears throat> implement the California Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act and the California Water Rights Law. These are parts of California Water Code. Implement the Federal Clean Water Act. Advise and consult on proposed changes in laws, regulations, budgets, and so forth. That actually takes up quite a bit of time, not so much for board members, but we have a lot of staff who are involved in constant review of legislative proposals because the proposals go through multiple revisions during the course of the session. And every one of them, the affected agencies, are asked to comment on them. We ensure due process and decision making, and there are a lot of rules associated with that. So for example, under the bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, I cannot discuss any decision pending before the board with more than one other board member. If I discussed it with two, more, that would make three of the five would constitute a serial meeting in violation of the act. We also have ex parte rules, which mean that I can't discuss certain types of proceedings with you if they're, they're in process, adjudicative proceedings. And we do all this in nauseating detail. <coughs> but we have no budget authority. This is something that people often misunderstand because we set our fees every year. We set them equal to the approved budget for fees. In fact, we did our fee uh, setting last week, and we raised fees very significantly on water quality permit holders by about 36% on average. Um, and uh, you know, but we don't have the discretion to set the budget. We were simply matching the approved budget, and we've been drawing down reserves over the last few years, and it was time for a large increase. Unfortunately, the timing couldn't have been worse just after two weeks of the Dow having its worst downward movement in, in quite a while and cities being uh, very, very concerned about their ability to, to pay these higher fees. But we needed to do it because the budget has been approved. We're certainly not going to go back and even think about <laughs> changing the budget. <clears throat> the functionally, what we do falls into four areas, planning and doing, which I'll describe on this page. And I'm going to use the plan, do, check, adapt format, which Deming made famous in management theory, um, and which is used in most in my environmental management systems under uh, um, ISO 14001 standards. So plan and policies. We have nine regional water quality control plans, a group of special plans like the ocean plan and policies. 
We do estimates and allocation of assimilative capacity to establish totable maximum daily loads, TMDLs, under the Clean Water Act. This is the core of our planning effort, although there are other pieces to it. The doing is to implement the plans, federal NPDES permits, federal Section 401 certification, state waste discharge requirements under Porter Cologne, state conditional waivers, that is to say the waste discharge requirements are waived for you if you satisfy certain conditions. State water rights permits and licenses, underground storage tank regulations, condi Ooh, I have conditional waivers twice. Well, there are a lot of them, actually. <coughs> I think there, I, I actually I asked for a list of them a year and a half ago, and I thought about putting it in the presentation. It runs off the page, and it's, it's amazing how many waivers we have. Uh, and we do state timber harvest plan review and, uh, and a few more things, but those are the biggest. In the check phase, to evaluate how we're doing, self-monitoring by regulated parties, Facility inspections by our staff or by others we've developed partnerships with. Regional monitoring, our surface water ambient monitoring program, also known as SWAMP. Groundwater ambient monitoring program called GAMMA and special studies. And then we adapt to what we found in the check phase through financial assistance, both grants and loans, enforcement orders, penalties, such as administrative civil liabilities, referrals to district attorneys or attorney general, or we can revise something in the plan or do groups. We can go back, having learned something from check, and just go back and amend a plan, go back and revise a permit. And last, we respond to petitions of regional board actions. The state board is the appellate authority over the, the regional boards. Some background on plans is useful. Um, our water quality control plans rule. They are the governing documents, mostly. Now, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, the plans govern, and this is very, very important. Under, each, under state law, each plan must contain beneficial use designations, receiving water objectives that are selected to protect the beneficial uses, and implementation plans to achieve those receiving water objectives. So there are plans inside the plans, which is a little bit semantically difficult, but that's how we're structured. And these receiving water objectives are also um, water quality standards under federal law. So if we do things right, the, the, the plans adopted under state law are also um, plans under federal law, and that gets rid of one of these mostly things, because federal law does rule in some instances over state law. But if we do it right, they're, they're consistent at the planning level, and from then on, the plans mostly rule. Adoption of receiving water objectives requires evaluation of economic and environmental impacts. Receiving water objectives must be implemented and enforced. Once they're adopted, they must be implemented and enforced. Too expensive for you to implement them? Well, too bad. They've been adopted already. I mean, this is, this is why the plans rule. Changing them requires years. Now, sometimes we can move more quickly. But in general, it takes years to do a plan or policy revision because of the CEQA involvement and because of the complexity of the issues and our, in our desire to give the stakeholders full due process. The only quicker, simpler ways to act, other than through the plans, are permits under the Clean Water Act, which don't require sequel review, a precedential decision on appeal, or enforcement actions, because there's a carve out in CEQA for enforcement. So if you really want rapid response, these are the things that we have to do. And those are not our usual core processes for solving problems over long periods of time, as you'll see as we get further into it. I thought this map was useful for um, Seeing where the swamp station locations are. This is our surface water ambient monitoring program. And can I give you? Oh, yeah, I skipped a slide there. Yeah. So I did background on plans, background on monitoring, then I'll show you the map. Self monitoring, again, by the dischargers themselves, they monitor their own effluent, and in some cases, nearby receiving water. We have lots of data, much less information. That is to say, what does all this compliance monitoring mean? A lot of the time, we don't really know. Uh, regional monitoring of ambient waters, well, we have some great programs, but some regions don't have them yet. We have a great program in the Bay Area, a great pro program across the three coastal southern regions. Uh, we have some what I would call nascent regional programs in some of the other regions. We've just kicked off an effort to develop a regional monitoring program in the Delta. The State Swamp Program is also a great program, but it's funded to around $12 million per year, and we need about $40 million, according to the analysis that was done uh, and reviewed by external peer reviewers. There are 1,835 stations. Last year, five, about 565,000 chemical tests, over 81,000 toxicity tests, about 8,500 tissue tests. It's a very substantial program, but California is a very big state. 
<clears throat> the State Gamma Program. This is groundwater. It's also a great program, and it is fully funded, I would say, at present. But it's funded with bond money that runs out in 2012. So we're going to have to figure out how to keep that program going thereafter. Only 116 of the 472 groundwater basins in the state will be assessed under gamma. This is the first time all these groundwater basins are being assessed in the state in a comprehensive way. However, these 116 include 99% of municipal pumping and 90% of agricultural pumping. <laughs> what would you suggest? Wait. How relaxing. Let's <laughs> take a little nap. Sure. I don't know. Diane, do you happen to know? Yeah, it is, um, it is separate. And it, the watersheds in each region are subdivided out, and then there's, we systematically go around to each of those watersheds and do a comprehensive analysis to gather data there. Yeah. So there's some overlap where in those locations, I was thinking where there's flow gates, um, but not, there's not necessarily an overlap of where they're doing water column sampling. Sure, go ahead. On the Gamma program, are you monitoring water quality or water withdrawals? Water quality, not water withdrawals. You're looking for the second mic? <laughs> Michael, you had a mic last. Do you, have it? you still have it? The mic is here. There we go. <laughs> oh, is that what it was doing? Is it updating? Uh huh. There we go. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Well then. So I was saying, we'll get it back in a minute, but I was just saying those 116 basins include 99% of municipal pumping and 90% of agricultural pumping, pesticide applications, and leaking underground tanks. So even though it's only 116 of the 472 watersheds, it picks up most of the high use um, aquifers in the state. And so the data from that program, it's the first full sweep through the state, is going to really tell us how we're doing. And you'll see when I start talking about failures, I think that in terms of surface water, and it, it, it's always hard to say this in front of staff, but I think we're failing, not because of our staff, but because of the, the magnitude of the, of, the, of the task. And with respect to groundwater, I don't think we really know, but the early results on gamma are not all that attractive in terms of the quality of, you know, that we're finding out there. Um, but I don't want to prejudge the entire state based on a, some it, early. When did it start? When did gamma really get rolling? Gamma. Well, SWAP was a was a <clears throat> um, a revision. A, 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 I don't know if SWAP existed as SWAP, but SWAP in its current incarnation in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002, something like that. We asked for in the vicinity of 60 to 80 million dollars for it. And we got 3.4 million to start. <laughs> um, you know, and that was in 01 or 02 after the dot com bust and state budget was in trouble at that time. I'm, say again? And when did Gamma start? Uh, gamma, um, I want to say 06, but I'm not certain of that. Uh, and I think we're only in the second round of testing. And by round, I don't mean the, all of the. The watersheds, the 116 are in a sequence, and we're in sort of phase two of the sequence. 2001 hearing and it was funded by Prop 50 in 2002. Thank you. So it was funded in 2002, so we didn't really get going probably until maybe 04, 05. We had the first data coming in. Does that sound right? Yeah. <clears throat> so why didn't this happen with 
I don't know. Well, I said California water rights law, and California water rights law refers to public trust within the, you know, in the code, it's one of the items that is listed that must be considered. Right, right. Well, that's a good point. Uh, the next slide is the map. You saw it already. <laughs> what I basically wanted to show you with the map is uh, that we're a very big state, and there are sections of the state. Admittedly, they're sort of desert and sparsely populated, where there's not even one monitoring station. And uh, although it looks a little clustered on a, you know, on a map, um, it looks like there are a bunch of, you know, there's one heck of a lot of monitoring in the Bay Area or something. Um, when you really get down to a lower scale, it's not a real dense. Uh, monitoring network. There are questions we can't answer at the current density. And after that, uh, I have a map which I'll show you uh, that shows the high use um, basins, the 116 basins that Gamma is testing where they're located at around the state. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Here. Make it so it won't hibernate. I'm happy to use the space bar, sure. There's the swamp map. There's some areas, there's some areas. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And even though these look pretty dense, you can actually identify every individual dot. There are 1,835, I think I said, through the state. So given the size of our state, it's really not a very dense network. These are the high use groundwater basins. The Central Valley dominates. Some others down in the Southern California coastal areas, a few in the Bay Area, that's Santa Clara. What's the definition of high use? Well, um, those are the ones that comprise 99% of, of water use in the state. I mean, they weren't, they weren't picked because a definition existed. They were picked to cover most of the water use in the state. <clears throat> I guess the clever answer is if they're in the gamma program, they're high use. All right, my criteria for success. Now we get to success and failure. And somehow, it's a little chopped up, but is a beneficial use outcome achieved, for example, fishable, drinkable, swimmable? I mean, have we achieved success in, in the, the mandates under the Clean Water Act or any other sort of common sense definition of what you'd expect water quality to be? Are receiving water objectives being met? These are the specific numbers, or in some cases, narrative standards that protect those beneficial uses. And we can actually measure for the numbers, whether we're achieving them or not. The narrative standards are a little harder to determine. Uh, so, so for example, a narrative toxicity um, standard would be, you shall not discharge toxic substances in toxic amounts. It's a little bit hard to determine sometimes whether that's going on or not. But other, in other cases, it's, we're, we're quite able to, using toxicity testing or other criteria. Are physical actions that clearly support such outcomes happening, even if use or receiving water outcomes are difficult to measure? So if we know that wastewater treatment plants are being built, a lot of them are being built, or all new underground storage tanks are being installed with double containment, then those actions are such that it's likely that the outcomes will be achieved, and we don't necessarily have to have direct measurements up here. And are we responsive in a procedural sense to emerging challenges? This is uh, one of my nods to Michael here in the presentation. This is an institutional economics metric. That is, does the supply of new rules satisfy the demand for new rules? You know, institutional economists like to talk about rules. Institutions of the society are the rules of the society. Uh, you know, Bank of America is not an institution to an economist. It's an organization. The institutions are the rules, and wealthier societies, there's a long literature on this, wealthier societies tend to change their rules in a reasonably 
suitable period of time and in a reasonably suitable way to address emerging challenges. And so they're able to you know, uh, maintain their wealth. Poor societies quite often are unable to change their rules, and so you have endless fighting, endless dissipation of energy between stakeholder groups in the society because they cannot work out their differences and move on. So the same fights repeat over and over and over again, and that parasitic energy prevents the society from making progress. Here's a success story, the first one, reducing sewage discharges to the San Francisco Bay. Uh, this is treatment plant discharges in uh, millions of gallons. I think up here is around 600 million gallons per day. This is the mass load of pollutants, as described here. Reduction in solids loading from publicly owned treatment works, 146 tons per day down to around 29 tons per day. And uh, around here is the adoption of the Clean Water Act. And around here is when you know, we can declare success and then we've maintained that success even though flows have increased a bit. It's a pretty clear success story, I think. Um, people who are around in those days say you couldn't drive across the Bay Bridge without holding your nose because of the, the, the smell at what is now the East Bay Mud wastewater treatment plant there at the base of the bridge. Uh, you know, we've all heard the stories about rivers and lakes catching on fire, that sort of thing. Those, those days are over. Factors driving the success. Well, Clean Water Act technology-based effluent limits, which were built around achieving certain levels of biological oxygen demand and total suspended solids, created a clear metric of progress. Install the technology. The Clean Water Act started out with a water quality basis, and kind of there it was hard to get traction at the beginning. Then there were amendments, which put it onto a technology basis, where there was a clear metric of progress, and people could get going and really move. And there was sustained funding for it. 75% of the cost of plants was paid for by federal grants, 12.5% by state grants, only 12.5% local match was required. The legislative mandate was specific enough to allow delegation without fragmentation. So what took place in California was similar to what took place in Nevada or someplace else. And note that this implies a loss of flexibility that may cause unnecessary investments. I mean, some of the treatment plants that were built uh, were not necessarily the best investments, but for the sake of reducing transaction costs and moving forward rapidly, uh, 15 years may not sound rapid, but it was given the magnitude of the challenge, for the sake of controlling uh, transaction costs, uh, some unnecessary investments get pulled along in the, in the system. Another success is leaking underground tanks. Underground storage tank program commencing in the 80s. Someone here probably knows the date, I don't. Applies to petroleum products only, and it's supported by a petroleum products fee. Nearly a quarter of our 1,600 staff work on underground tanks. Clean up of tanks that leaked, well, there were 42,980 leaking tanks found so far. 31,485 of them have been cleaned up, and the case is closed to date. There are 11,495 cases still active, and 862 cleaned up and closed in the last 12 months, so you get a sense of sort of the current progress. We disperse, I just learned this recently, we disperse money for cleanups to around between three and 4,000 tank sites each year. So even though only 862 cleaned up in the last year, we're actively dispersing money in the range of three to 4,000. And we've adopted regulations requiring tank technology that should prevent future leaks. What are the factors driving that success? Well, a clear metric of progress, new tanks met technology standards, petroleum product cleanups to background unless a residual will not threaten beneficial uses. So there's a little bit of an out there from the technology standard. Again, the funding was adequate and sustained over several decades. The legislative mandate was specific enough to allow delegation without fragmentation of the effort. We've even delegated a lot of this down to the county level. So it goes beyond the regional boards. It's delegated down to the county level, and the system continues to work without everyone getting confused about the rules, and it's, why is it different in my county or whatever. And the flexibility for residuals does slow down progress and increases transaction costs, but it reduces the risk of unnecessary investments, and that seems to have been a, a good innovation in the program. It, it makes the program more manageable, and you know, people like the fact that we can close a site before it's completely and utterly cleaned up um, if the residual is very small and not, not likely to cause harm. Third example, a failure that I hope is on its way to success, State Water Board Recycled Water Policy. In June of 2003, the legislatively mandated Recycled Water Task Force recommended the State Board reduce uncertainty associated with recycled water permitting. We got a draft staff policy proposal in early 2008. Now, what took place between those five, you know, five years 
Well, there was a lot of churn going on. Our staff prepared guidelines, but the board members didn't give clear guidance as to what they really wanted. Did they want a policy that told the regions what to do? Of course, the regions didn't want to be told what to do because they wanted to accommodate local circumstances and have flexibility to not force unnecessary investments. Um, uh, the chair of the task force, co-chair of the task force is a formal, former state board member, but nonetheless, there wasn't strong ongoing guidance after the task force report came out. And so things just kind of lingered. Now, admittedly, there was a budget crisis and uh, the state board was not flush with staff, uh, but there was also a certain amount of denial. I mean, I've just heard this throughout the system from people who thought that there wasn't a problem, that it was just those recycled water people in the agencies whining. And I heard that a lot less from our staff than I heard it from NGOs. I mean, to be fair to people, you know, the, the non-governmental organizations, you know, just kept saying, they're just whining, it's no big deal, they should go get permits. It's not a big deal. Um, well, the draft staff policy proposal in early 2008 basically said enough of this, We've got to do something with the policy. There is a real problem. It is not an enormous problem, but it is a real problem. It's been long enough. We need to address it. And the stakeholders were unified only by their dislike of the policy. They all hated it. And they hated it in diametrically different ways. I mean, I had this comment to them at the time when they came to us and said, don't adopt this policy. We all hate it. And they were unified. I said, have you read each other's comment letters? You need to sit down and read each other's comment letters, which they did in which they have now sat down and gone through stakeholder meetings to come up with an alternative proposal in August, which is a pretty decent proposal where they worked out most of their differences, although there is one big difference left. And formal policy consideration is tentatively scheduled for January 2009. I, got a hold, I get a little bit ahead of my story, though. So what, what caused this failure? Well, the stakeholders were bitterly divided from the beginning. The previous board didn't tell the staff how to respond. But the external demand for reform kept growing. And board level champions for a policy began to push seriously in early to mid 2007. That was myself and board member Francis Spivey Weber, who's done a lot of work on recycled water before joining the board. And I'm a sanitary engineer, so I had all kinds of people in the uh, brotherhood and sisterhood of sanitary engineering calling me before I even took office saying, when you get up there, this is something that needs to be taken care of because it's been dragging for way too long. And we were willing to offend people if needed to get something done. And legislation driving the landscape irrigation permits was adopted in 2007. Senator De La Torre in Los Angeles said, enough is enough. We'll just mandate it through legislation if necessary. And we had more legislation proposed in 2008, two other pieces of legislation which uh, weren't adopted um, because we said we're, we're really underway. We are going to take care of this problem now. But this is an institutional economics failure, if you will. There wasn't a recognition that demand existed and needed to be responded to. Then that recognition was turned around, and we're moving toward a solution. Funding also was not a major issue, which makes this a lot easier to, to deal with. And I would say in the Bay Area, we have a general waste discharge requirement for recycled water. And I never heard a single horror story out of the Bay Area. I want to be sure Diane takes this back to everyone in the Bay Area. There were no horror stories here. The horror stories were in the Central Valley, in Santa Rosa, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, Santa Ana and this region didn't have any problems. And I never heard anything out of Colorado or La Hanta or others. So, you know, there were some regions with all kinds of problems and other regions clearly were doing fine. So it's not, you know, it, it's a, it's a non-uniform story. I want to be careful that my statements about what was going on inside the system are taken in context. An outright failure. Water quality objectives are not being met. The Clean Water Act 303D list of, quote, impaired waters, impaired surface waters, in California is one way of estimating success or failure at a statewide level. Some caveats on that, well, there are other less bleak but also less comprehensive summaries that exist, so one could argue with this. And receiving water objectives may not always accurately portray impacts on beneficial uses. They're proxies for outcomes, so the fact that we're violating them doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. But overall, it's hard, I think, to argue that we will at any time soon satisfy all receiving water objectives and attain all beneficial uses for most surface waters in California. Here's the map. This is from the most recent 303D list of water quality limited segments. All the red are the water quality limited segments in the state. Pretty much wherever people live, we have a lot of people live, we have water quality limited segments. And the North Coast, because it was logged so heavily, has degradation for sediment and temperature. 
And this is a map of the listings over time, a graph of listings over time, 804 listings when we, or not quite when we first did it, but the first time we have solid data, I guess, the graph the staff gave to me. And then each couple of years, we revise the listings. We add and we subtract. And the net has been an upward movement. I voted on this one. I was not around for this one. So I, I saw this 250 listing increase occur, net increase. I think we delisted 150 or so. So it was maybe 400 new and 150 delisted. And then these are the listings that have been addressed so far through TMDLs, total maximum daily loads that have been adopted. So you know we're making progress. This distance is the gap, but we're certainly not closing the gap. And it's a very, very big gap. Now, in fairness, maybe we're getting better at it, and so you know we'll be able to catch up. But you know, even if we get considerably better, it's going to take a long time. Factors driving this failure? Well, assimilative capacity, which is what you do in a TMDL. You say, here's the assimilative capacity of the watershed, and uh, we're exceeding it. We're putting too much nutrient in for what it can handle. So now we have to reduce everyone down to a level. Uh, that involves allocating the assimilative capacity to different parties, and then everyone who's above that has to reduce to that level. Assimilated capacity that protects those uses is often tough to quantify and measure. There's no single parameter like BOD or technology like double wall tanks that will achieve compliance in most cases. TMDLs involve distributed decisions, unlike technologies imposed uniformly by regulation. And I'm, I'm cheating a little bit here because the technologies are distributive too. But what I mean by that is if everyone in the state who installs a tank has to follow the rules, or everyone in the state who has sewage has to build a secondary wastewater treatment plant, it's pretty uniform. It's not you win and you lose. But allocating assimilative capacity can be you win and you lose. You know, you get all the assimilative capacity and you have to stop discharging waste. Although we don't do things that extreme, but it may be very uneven as to who we put the burden on. And it's very much a you win, you lose kind of situation. So that's very difficult to build consensus around. Uh, the boards have been quite successful at building consensus around them. I mean, the number of the TMDLs that are adopted that are contentious and come to the state board and have a bitter fight is pretty small compared to the total number. But that adds to the time it takes and the cost it takes to get them done. Our approach has also been highly non-uniform, lots of regional and local flexi flexibility, and therefore transaction costs are high and progress is slow. Another failure, phase one stormwater. How am I doing on time? Because I lost track because of the computer breaking down. Twenty, let's say. I'll start over. Okay, I'm fine. Another failure: Phase One stormwater. The receiving water objectives are not being met in many Phase One urban areas, which is population greater than 100,000, and I'll show you that on a map in the next slide. The Phase One program has had over 15 years, in some cases almost 20, to work. And there's little evidence that beneficial uses or water quality are improving. And I say little evidence because it's not clear that we haven't made progress, just we can't prove it. Certainly, you know, we've made progress in terms of the public awareness. Every storm drain in these areas is now stenciled, you know, drains to bay, do not dump. Um, you know, we, we clearly have done things, that, there have been actions that would improve uh, the quality of stormwater discharges and the receiving waters, but we can't really prove. Uh, that you know, we've done a lot to help beneficial uses, with one exception, clean beaches, where we have very good data and we can show reduced number of closings and postings. Uh, but even in that case, the last two winters were dry, so it's a little bit unclear what's going to happen the next time we have a heavy winter in the southern coastal areas. That's when we really know if the clean beaches efforts are, are making a difference. Here's permit coverage, and this is all different kinds of stormwater uh, um, permits. But what I want to show you are the blue, the light blue areas, and then here, here, LA area. I think that's, is that Riverside or San Bernardino? I forget. Who's? I think that's Riverside. Right. And that's Riverside, and that's San Bernardino, and then San Diego. So these are the areas that are heavily urbanized and that are in the phase one, uh, phase one MS4 permits, municipal separate storm sewer system. Separate storm sewer system. Permits. Um, I'm going to talk about why it's a failure. Yeah, but before I talk about why it's a failure, I want to talk about money and spending on it. Um, the spending need, and I have a question mark here because it's not really an assessment of need. It's sort of a gross ballpark thing that engineers learn to do. 
and people get scared when you start throwing these numbers around. But in terms of ballpark numbers, I find it useful. The spending need, quote, need, is something like two to 10 times our current spending. And the way I got to that is there was a survey of spending on stormwater systems in California. It was around $40 a household a year, maybe 35 unadjusted, then they did some adjustments for some reason I can't remember, and it came down to maybe 25. There's a National Association of Flood and Storm Management Agencies, Stormwater Phase Two survey. These are small communities spending much less. An EPA uh, Stormwater Phase One survey um, nationwide spending way less than we're spending in California. I mean, we're just miles ahead in California. Uh, but the California Wastewater Survey, what we spend on sanitary sewage service, uh, and this is residential only, is over $300 per household per year compared to at most, you know, maybe $35 per household per year. And if you look at a study from the LA area in terms of what you might need to spend on stormwater to really get things right, the current effort is down here, maybe $20 a household a year. A pollution prevention scenario, a little more aggressive, was 25 or 30. A, a wetlands, you know, constructed wetlands sort of throughout the urban area with infiltration basins, a low impact development thing throughout the, the urban area. Significantly more, but not as much as you might expect, uh, maybe $70 a household a year. And then way up here, if you, if you connected all those storm drains together to centralized treatment, it's essentially comparable to sanitary sewerage. And the way this number was done, it doesn't actually include commercial and industrial. So if you loaded them in there, the, the bars would be very similar in cost. So going back to where I started, these bars, you know, what we're roughly spending now, maybe in LA, double that is probably what you need for an LID scenario. Maybe 10 times might be what you need for centralized treatment. So there are significant spending needs. Now, you know, everyone who's pushing these advanced uh, um, stormwater treatment technologies say, oh, they don't cost anymore. And they don't in many cases. But overall, you're still talking about a lot of spending. So, so the the issue is not do our regulations cost more, but how is the more spending that's going to happen going to get spent? We're going to have to double our level of spending or more. Some of that will be driven by regulation, but perhaps very little. Some of that is just what is needed to deal with the systems as they are today, to replace systems, to upgrade systems. Are we going to spend it wisely or not? But any way you look at it, it's a lot of money. It's a big step up from where we are. And that leads to the discussion of, of failure. Federal and state funding is relatively small and episodic and usually highly competitive for stormwater uh, programs. The local share is 90% or more. It's the reverse of the point source program. Proposition 218 makes local finance difficult. Progress is difficult to measure, with the beaches excluded. Local control over land use is affected, which creates a lot of uh, give and take. The Clean Water Act did not mandate a clear outcome for stormwater regulation. Instead, it used what I consider to be inherently ambiguous phrases. Now, lawyers will tell you otherwise, but then if you talk to two or three lawyers, it, I think it becomes clear to non-lawyers it's inherently ambiguous. But I'll let you draw your own opinion on that. It uses ambiguous phrases like, best management practice to the maximum extent practical. Well, what is best? What is maximum extent practical? Has anyone ever you know, measured the marginal cost against the marginal benefit to determine MEP at the city scale and therefore determine what is best at a point in time? I've never seen it. So as an economist, I don't know what this means. I know what it should mean, but we don't really do things that way, and that's not really what the law is talking about. <clears throat> or, or we have uh, best control technology or uh, best conventional technology or best available technology economically achievable. Well, economically achievable, again, ambiguous. And this fuzzy legislative mandate encourages fragmentation at the state and lower levels and very high transaction costs. Now, every time we go to court and we get argued with, people now who want to shoot down whatever was adopted are probably going to dig up this tape on the web and say, but the vice chair of the board said it was inherently a bigger. <laughs> so I was asked beforehand, was I going to say anything controversial? And I really didn't think this would be controversial until I got to just this moment and realized, hmm, some lawyers out there might try to use this. The delta, another failure. Well, would anyone not call it a failure? Clearly, beneficial uses are impaired. But what's strange about it is the receiving water objectives are being met mostly. I mean, the, the standards we set, previous board we, set to protect beneficial uses in the delta are mostly being met. And the required actions, the specific actions that are specified in the, the 1995 and updates Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan and in Decision 1641, 
Most of the required actions were taken or being done. Not all, but most. Of course, some actions that might have helped were not required in, in those times. For example, fish screens or reverse flow limits, where they're, they're not required. So this is a failure by the institutional criterion. I, the, the new rules have not emerged in response to failure of the old rules. I mean, it's not, I mean, I suppose you could say it's a failure also by the beneficial use uh, criteria. The beneficial uses are impaired. But certainly the, the intermediate criteria, the receiving water objectives or the actions, it's hard to say w what we did wrong. And that's why I talked about plans rule. Because if the plan misses the point, if the plan is an inadequate plan, then you can implement it and enforce it all you want, and you're still going to have a failure. Factors driving this. Well, scientific uncertainty is high. Given the challenge, staff resources are very thin. Uh, in order to uh, put more resources into the Bay Delta, which we've been doing, uh, starting in July a year ago, the board decided that the Delta was one of its highest priorities, and we've been shifting resources into it. In order to do that, we basically have to poach off the Division of Water Rights, although we try to pull the resources from other places when possible. But the Division of Water Rights is understaffed, grossly so. We have 70 people in the division. That's, I'm told that's 10 less than we had in 1968 when water rights authority was given to the state board. So it's grossly underfunded. Um, and yet we're trying to stretch you know, and, and, and deal with issues in the Delta. And so that means less staff available for other water rights functions. Um, and uh, right now, funding for water rights is tied up in the Supreme Court. There's a case pending with respect to whether the way we allocated fees among parties uh, is legal or not. And for that very reason, the, the, the Legislative Analyst Office recommended against the governor's budget proposal for more water rights and associated enforcement staff. When we fought internal to the administration to get six new positions approved for water rights in a BCP, a budget change proposal, and three more for enforcement, for our enforcement group, which are mostly going to be used associated with water rights, and both of those budget change proposals were approved in the assembly, not approved in the Senate, not approved in committee. For this reason, I mean, that's the reason that was given. The LAO recommended against it as premature until the Supreme Court uh, resolves this issue. And I was just told by our, our chief counsel last week in public session when we adopted fees for the coming year that the California Supreme Court has not yet put it on a docket. So we don't know when it'll be heard. Um, another, another failure factor, there was no metric for biological success. That is to say, we didn't have you know, a criteria when the stock of smelt or the stock of some fish fall below some, some level, you're in trouble, we need to take more action. There was no such criteria. Uh, receiving waters in the Delta just involved distributed decisions with large financial consequences, like the TMDLs, but way worse. <laughs> The governance structure at the federal and state levels does not adhere to lending agency norms to separate project operators from regulators. I mean, just look at the governance structure. You know, the Department of Fish and Game and we are in the same governance structure as the Department of Water Resources. And the federal government, uh, um, the fisheries agencies are in the same governance structure as uh, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. And we know from Judge Wanger's two decisions so far that the biological opinions that were issued by uh, marine fisheries, um, sorry, no, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, were deemed by him not credible. They were contradictory to the underlying science that you know, agency staff had, uh, had stated. And I'm not taking a position about his decision. I'm just saying he decided that twice. And um, you know, at minimum, perceptions of bias, of suppression of information, uh, potential conflicts of interest, and so forth. And uh, it's just not a good structure. We'd be better off if we had a different structure. These potential conflicts of interest, an interesting story that came up in the budget debate, uh, which is you know, removed from the delta, but it gives you an idea of how these potential conflicts of interest can, can occur, when the governor said you know, state employees should be paid minimum wage after a certain date. And the comptroller said, no, that's not what the law requires. The governor said the law requires it. The comptroller said, no, the law doesn't require it. Well, the attorney general's office, I heard, had attorneys in it who were assigned to both sides and had to kind of figure out what to do. People who work with each other on a regular basis. It's very difficult when you know, two parts of the entity are, are, are in a fight, in a legal fight, and have to go to court. Key challenges in these examples, in all of the examples. Assimilator capacity is the limiting environmental resource. How we calculate it and allocate it is an emerging critical social choice. Think about climate change. I mean, you know, uh, oil and coal are no longer the limiting resource. 
the atmosphere's ability to absorb carbon is now the limiting resource. We're moving toward that in water. The limiting resource is no longer you know, what we can do on the technology end of discharge. It's what the environment can handle when we discharge. And we're going to have to calculate it and allocate it. And this actually applies to water rights to some extent also, because in some cases, taking water out of the stream reduces assimilative capacity. So it's really an allocation of assimilative capacity. That's not, I mean, all water rights decisions don't reduce to that, but it's an element of some water rights decisions. So it's a, it's a critical challenge that goes through these issues. Integrated measures of water quality are needed. The old pollutant by pollutant regulatory paradigm can't be sustained. Um, I mean, I suppose this could be controversial, but I just don't see how we can sustain it. And I've heard a lot of people say that. You know, at, with, you know, we have 129 priority pollutants. We have thousands of potential emerging contaminants. Even if a few hundred of them are toxic, how are we going to keep up with setting, you know, compound by compound standards? Um, so we have to be looking at integrative measures, index of biological integrity for the aquatic health of the habitat, chronic toxicity testing to screen surface water discharges in the health of receiving waters, um, uh, chip-based measures of the presence of pathogens so that you know, drinkability and swimmability at beaches and in, and in raw water supplies can be measured in a simple way. That kind of thing really has to become the way we do our evaluation in the future. Old boundaries need to be redrawn. For example, land use and water quality regulation involve us crisscrossing over the boundaries of land, you know, of where, where our regulation ends and where someone else's regulation begins. We have shared authorities and we have to figure out how to do that. And resource limitations are permanent in terms of budgets and capital spending. We need to adapt to that reality. And these four actually fit with the plan, do, check, uh, adapt framework earlier, but I forgot to put that on here and they're out of order. This is the primary planning challenge. This is a primary do challenge, a primary uh, check challenge, and a primary adapt challenge. A couple last slides, and we'll go to question and answer. Where to from here? Well, we are working to sustain our efforts, including commitments of staff. That is to say, one of the success factors was sustained effort over decades. So we need to be clear as a board, what are our top efforts, and keep that up over time. We cannot just be shifting priorities. Better specify measurable outcomes of actions. Leverage investments in monitoring through more regional monitoring programs and something I've been calling the Water Data Institute, which has been uh, endorsed in our strategic plan and endorsed in our information management technology report. Uh, what this is is some sort of external entity that would be supported with state funds, stakeholder funds, and so forth, and it would do nothing but manage water data, all water data, water, water quantity, water quality, and its job is to um, make that data as valuable as possible, as accessible as possible, and periodically review the sources of data, make recommendations as to how the contributors of data might revise their programs and requirements to provide more useful data so the data becomes information rather than becoming you know, bits on a, you know, on a drive someplace. Um, better balance transaction costs and flexibility. We actually did that in our compliance schedule policy, and I don't have time to talk about that, but that was an interesting experience to, to reduce transaction costs but also reduce flexibility uh, and how stakeholders responded to that. But we did that this last year. Recognize more rapidly when change is needed. We're doing that. Be more willing to displease stakeholders if necessary. We're formally doing the first five. And I think the new board is learning to do the sixth as well, but we will see how long that lasts. Um, you know, I'm pending confirmation, and we have two board members pending uh, re-nomination in the January 15 to March 15 time frame. And uh, hopefully we've upset a few people because we were pushing to get some things done, and hopefully we didn't set it, upset anyone too much to disrupt what we're doing as a board and to prevent us from sustaining our efforts over time. Last slide, strategic plan updates and a structural reform proposal have been completed. Emphasis on organizational effectives and measurement of outcomes, outputs, et cetera, in the plan. Specific actions to maximize staff resources through less fragmentation and more leveraging. If you looked at Appendix 1 of the strategic plan, you'd see that, including specifically the Delta and monitoring. We created a Delta team, and we've endorsed the Water Data Institute and regional monitoring. The WQII, which is our, um, or the governor's proposal for restructuring in response to Senator Parada's proposal of restructuring, formally acknowledges the need for change from within with the support of all 10 board chairs. I cannot tell you what it took to do that. I mean, I don't even agree with every element of the WQII, but 
you know, it's a, it's a monumental achievement. Love it or hate it, that is real institutional progress. From within the system, the system said, we have some problems. Here's how we propose to change our rules in order to do a better job as a system. And it's a very good starting point for conversation with the Little Hoover Commission, the legislature in the coming years, and so forth. And last, the Bay Delta Work Plan. Uh, with enough time, it will work. But do we have enough time? I don't know. Uh, I was asked by some people, what are you going to say about the Delta today? And I've, I've said some things. But I wanted to conclude with this thought. I think we're on the right track. I think that we will succeed through our Bay Delta Work Plan. But it will take time. We are slow. And we have to go back and revise a water quality control plan, then implement it. And that takes time. And I don't know if we have enough time, given the, the condition of the estuary. With that, I'd be happy to take questions. Perfect. Ah, in the back. How do you respond to the criticisms from Delta, uh, on the Delta, how do you respond to criticisms from folks like the Delta uh, Vision Task Force and the uh, resources agency departments actually as well? Um, on the Delta, that you just haven't done your job. You have all authority, and you just haven't done your job. Well, who's made the criticism? Delta Vision and who Delta else? Vision Task Force. OK, I'll express this strong concern that you have not acted. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and Delta Vision Task Force, and then department heads within the resources agencies. What department heads? <laughs> Lester Fish, Snow. Fish and Game? Fish and Game. Well, then why doesn't Fish and Game send people over to the evidentiary hearings that I called for? Uh, that's they refuse. I, I'm they asking you, so that's okay, why. Here's an answer. Fish and Game recently said they won't even send people to informational hearings to sort out the basic science, because they're too busy with other things. They don't want us to do more specifically with respect to uh, public trust, hearings, and so forth. At least that's the, the, you know, the feedback that we've gotten. Uh, Department of Water Resources, the same. They're, they're putting their eggs on BDCP. They believe the BDCP will solve the, the delta. And the staff recommendation that came to us in July for part two of the uh, Bay Delta work plan was to wait until the middle of 2010 to not commence a review of the 1995, well, it was updated in 2006, but basically the 1995, to not commence a review of the plan. And uh, uh, DWR liked that. None of the state agencies objected to that. Uh, so with respect to state agencies, I mean, I haven't heard any criticism that we're not taking action. In fact, I consistently hear from people don't mess up the, the apple cart. You know, don't mess things up. BDCP is going to solve this. Work with us. Send your staff to our meetings. Don't jump in. Don't cause problems. That's what I hear consistently from state agencies. Now, with respect to Delta Vision, I have to admit that I have not been able to keep up with the volume of paperwork coming out of Delta Vision. So I've heard some things along the way. You know, the state board was, has been too timid. The state board hasn't done this. And that. I don't know. I mean, I mean, looking back, I have to say that it's a mess, and maybe the previous state board was too timid. Um, you know, the 1995 plan doesn't seem rigorous enough to me. Uh, but, you know, it's always, in hindsight, it's always easy to criticize people. So, you know, we have a relatively new board. And if there's direct criticism of this board as not having acted strongly enough, I would have to respond that commencing in July of 2007, we made the Delta top priority. Within six months, we had a full work plan in front of us, including some very aggressive actions that we did pull back from a little bit. We then adopted the second half of it. <coughs> in the middle of 2008, uh, and we're commencing to implement that plan. Now we're very slow. And uh, if the criteria is, have we commenced a public trust action against the projects, then I guess we're a failure, and we're timid. I mean, if that's your criteria. But by any other criteria, I would say that we've been aggressive. I mean, you should have been at the hearing in, in uh, December of 2007 and the hearing in, in July of 2008, and heard criticisms of the work plan, which we just said, sorry, we have to, we have to move forward, and we did. So it, I guess it depends on their criteria. Uh, but I think that we have been pretty proactive, pretty active. Um, we haven't gone as far as some people would like. Uh, but the you know, story's not over yet either. Gary, you sh started by showing the um, TMDL comparison of GAP. And it also sort of fits with your, uh, uh, we shouldn't keep going pollutant by pollutant. And one could argue that um, a quarter to a large portion of staff time in the agency is trying to handle the TMDLs 
issue. It's not clear that a lot of the contaminants that you're regulating have been banned. It's not clear how much more benefit you're going to get from long, constrained action. Many of the TMDLs in the region, it's the difference between a 50 to 100 years. There's not a lot of difference in what you can do. Meanwhile, we're missing all these new contaminants that have come in and replaced. Pyrethroids is the great example. Is there a way that you can implement that thought of yours of trying to uh, uh, do better on kind of handling new issues, handling RWOs by speeding the, somehow just pushing the TMDL process through of let's get some improvement and let's just take a first step to get some improvement to get this backlog of 2,000 TMDLs off our plate so we can focus our energy better. Well, it's interesting you mentioned pyrethroids because the, uh, the Bay Area TMDL for um, pesticide-related toxicity, pesticide-related, was it toxicity, Diane? Yeah. Um, didn't restrict itself to dealing with diazinon, which had already been banned in urban use. Uh, it established target of one toxicity unit for discharges from the stormwater um, agencies and uh, allocated full responsibility to the stormwater agencies. And so they did use an integrative measure, basically a toxicity unit um, from all sources combined is, you know, is the water toxic um, without dilution. Um, and so I would say it is an integrative measure and it is a you know, a success along those lines that deals with all those emerging contaminants. If the indicator organisms are specified properly and all, and you know, we have adequate density of monitoring and all those those sub points. Um, I'm not sure if your question was aimed at should we dump the TMDL program? I mean, should we? Is there some? Are you asking for a, a different paradigm? Is it, no? is it useful for where you're trying to? How is it consistent? It's a huge problem. Yeah. Maybe yeah. is it interfering right. with the approach you're laying out for how to improve? Well, I think there's, there are two ways to deal with, with, deal with that. One is to improve the effectiveness of the existing approach, which is a water quality based approach. Um, we can template TMDLs over the regions and over issues. We can uh, build cross board you know, teams. We can uh, move things forward in batches. So, you know, in the Napa, uh, Napa River watershed and the Sonoma Creek watershed, instead of having separate TMDLs for you know, nutrients and pathogens, you know, have them in the same document. Um, we can get more efficient. That's going to get us some distance, but not all the way there. And then we have to up the resources, whether that means shifting resources from something else or finding some other way to do it, but up the resources. So we can continue to push ahead on the water quality based approach through TMDLs, or we could take a different track completely different track. And I'm not sure what that would be except for technology. Um, you could develop a set of technology standards uh, related to the major impairments in the state, whether they're from non-point source or point source, and impose those through legislation or statewide regulation. Just, you know, do these technologies. Um, it would be far fewer transaction costs. Uh, with adequate funding, it would be better. But if we had adequate funding, you know, maybe the water quality approach wouldn't be as hard either. So I'm not, I'm not sure that the technology approach would, would do better. But it's worth considering. If you have a third approach, then that's worth considering too. But so far, I don't, I don't have any bright ideas about how to fill that whole backlog other than being more efficient in the use of staff time, more effective in the way we go about dealing with these issues through templating, being a little more aggressive, that kind of thing. I'm sorry, I should, I should comment about emerging contaminants. The Recycled Water uh, Stakeholder Group recommended that we convene a um, expert panel on emerging contaminants to make recommendations for recycled water regulation, and that that should be updated every, was every three years thereafter, every so many years thereafter. It might make sense to either expand that panel or have a parallel panel for some other issues. Gary, I'd like to ask you a question regarding the, the State Board's water rights uh, responsibility and recognizing that you're speaking tonight as an individual and not on behalf of the Board. Uh, California is, uh, with, along with Texas, is the only uh, state in the American West that doesn't regulate 
groundwater rights at a statewide basis. Uh, and some, some folks, myself included, think that that's a, a serious omission. Do you believe, uh, from a regulator's perspective, that that is a problem? And do you support increasing the board's authority to encompass groundwater uh, water rights uh, authority? Well, um, if you want to get to a, an effective ultimate system, we need to regulate groundwater outside of what we regulate now, which is water flowing in well-defined subterranean streams. <clears throat> Whether that regulation has to occur at the state level, though, is questionable. The Groundwater Management Act creates the ability of local areas to create groundwater management agencies, um, and the courts can adjudicate. So if there were more adjudication and if we mandated that local areas have to get together and, and create groundwater management agencies and do that job correctly, maybe that would solve you know, many of the problems. I mean, certainly uh, the Santa Clara Valley uh, Water District, which manages their groundwater basin, does a good job of, of preventing overdraft of that basin because it was historically overdrafted and they were created in part for the purpose of, of addressing the problem. And there are other examples around the state. So it doesn't have to be state level, but it has to be addressed somehow. Uh, with respect to our doing it, um, you know, as much as I'd love to take it on, I, I, you know, I've told you, we're, we're not capable of doing what we're trying to do now. I mean, we actually do a very good job. I'm quite impressed with the Water Rights Group, maybe because they uh, you know, work under very difficult pressing conditions. But I'm pretty impressed with the Water Rights Group. People who, who criticize the Water Rights Group are not being fair to the Water Rights Group. Under the conditions that they toil, they do an excellent job. But I just don't know that we could put anything new on them without a very large augmentation of resources. Yeah, just at your last slide, you mentioned the water quality in the double eyes. And anyway, I would like you to expand a little bit on where you see the uh, water state water board going organizationally. Yeah. In the future. Well, there's there's what we're going internally uh, through the strategic plan, and then there is the proposal for structure reform. Are you interested in both or the? Well, internally, the system is basically 10 boards that share a budget. And uh, 40 years ago, that made perfect sense. I mean, there wasn't that much need for everything to be the same in the different regions, and there weren't you know, that many appeals, and when there were, they were resolved, and so forth. Now, um, you know, efficiency is much more important under the conditions that we have today. I mean, the staff was cut rather dramatically in the 2001 um, cutback. I don't remember those numbers offhand, but it was in the hundreds. you know. There's a lot, of, a lot of staff. So, um, and right now we have a hiring freeze. We can't fill vacancies. Um, so, you know, under the conditions of today and that I think are permanent going forward, we need to be much more effective in our internal use. And that means to me, cross board teams, templating of things. We actually have an NPDES permit template, which is not always followed. We had to remand an order out of the, the Central Valley region recently because, well, there are a bunch of reasons, but one, had to do with uh, they failed to include uh, a narrative toxicity uh, standard. And um, I mean, it's just elementary. Uh, it should have been in the template. I think it was in the template. Someone told me that. I don't know. But you know, that kind of thing shouldn't have to come up for remand. We should be able to handle that. So we should be able to work cross, cross boards at the staff level, have a one staff concept, if you will, that works more effectively. Um, and that's a cultural change, and there are a lot of people on staff who support that as long as it doesn't take away authority from the regions, as long as it doesn't turn into state board taking everything over, which is certainly not my intent. In fact, if I had my way, we would take, I don't know, 100 state board employees and assign them to regions. They'd stay in Sacramento, but they'd be assigned to work in the regions because they'd have a much better sense of what is actually needed at the front lines of this organization. Um, uh, so internally, we need to do a better job of using our resources across the boards, more efficient teamwork, et cetera. There are some other things in the plan. I'm drawing a little bit of a blank now, but it's spelled out to some extent in the plan. Um, and then structurally, <clears throat> we need to simplify what, what takes place at the board level. Um, the WQII uh, proposed that the board chairs be full time and that a council of chairs be created to serve as a, a recommending body for when inconsistencies across the boards should be resolved, should be taken up by the state board. I think the Council of Chairs is an excellent idea. It will um, lead the chairs to talk with one another about the differences between the regions. Something I did not realize until I went to the state board, having served on a regional board, is at the regional board level, I mean at the board level, not the staff level, but at the board level, you mostly don't know what's going on in other regions. You don't know that we're doing it differently than they're doing it. 
you know, our, our, our pathogens, TMDLs, uh, are different than the pathogens, TMDLs in some other region. We don't, we don't know that even at the regional board level. So having the chair serve in this council is a good idea. I don't personally like paying them full time. Uh, I think that it will diminish the pool. I mean, we've got some excellent chairs who would certainly not give up their jobs to be full time. I mean, it'll diminish the pool. It could create tension with executive officers. There, there's some issues there. But certainly the council of chairs is a great idea. Um, I also think that the Water Quality Coordinating Committee meetings that occur twice a year when all 81 regional board members and five state board members are invited to get together twice a year to talk about topics, that's in the water code, that they should be made mandatory and people should be paid to attend because that would be a convergence type of activity. You have to go twice a year, you're paid decently to attend, and you know, we'll get some convergence at the board level. That's not actually in WQII. Um, so there's some things like, like that. Uh, WQII talks about delegating permits down to the staff level. I know that would reduce due process, and it's pretty much uniformly hated by the stakeholders for that reason. But if we added to the proposal, as has been suggested by some of the stakeholders, administrative law judges who could then process appeals from a legal perspective first, which would then get, I mean, what are the five state board members doing making a decision about whether the Clean Water Act requires something or not? You know, I mean, realistically, the five state board members are not the best people to do that kind of nitty gritty legal analysis. So if we had administrative law judges and then we delegated down to the, board, to the executive officers, then those issues would get handled at that level. Then when there's a policy issue embedded in a permit, then it could rise to the board of an appeal to the state board. But really, from my presentation, the policy issue should not be decided at the permit level or in precedential orders except in rare cases, they should be decided in the plan itself. We should be doing that in the plans and in the policies. When everyone can talk to everyone else also under the ex parte rules. So there are these changes that can pull us together. They're not all in the WQII. There's contention around it, but it's a very good place to start the discussion, I think. Gary, um, some people think that um, beneficial use should maybe be redefined to allow water transfers from people that own the beneficial use rights. And I'm not sure if your board has anything to do with that, but I'm wondering if that were to be a goal, um, how would your board interact with other agencies in the state to make that happen? What would, what would be the process? What would the process be like? I'm sorry, I momentarily lost in the beginning of the question. I was what talking would the about process be like to achieve what? Beneficial use, to redefine beneficial use to include water transfers from the holders of the water rights to other parties, for example, through a water market. So, because um, as far as so I understand, you, you're going to transfer water to someone. Sure. And that you want that transfer to be designated as a beneficial use. That's you, right. You, you've lost me. I mean, your use of the water is a beneficial use of the water. Already. Right. So your use would end up being selling it to somebody instead of using it on your on your land, for example. Well, tra um, I'm a little lost. I mean, transfer have you heard, have you heard transfers of that? can occur now within contractors among the state and federal projects because the way they define the place of use is very broad. Right. So the, our approval is not needed. Um, transfers between water rights holders post-1914 need our approval and analysis of third-party impacts. Uh, but I'm not quite clear what you're getting with defining them. Say that a, a, a pre-1914 uh, holder of, yeah. in, in, a, in a rice growing district wants to sell water to East Bay Mud yeah. as a beneficial use. Do you guys have any role in that? Pre-1914, no. After 1914? Yes. Why? Well, because their water right says that there's a place of use and they want to change the place of use. So they essentially have to get their water right amended. And that, and that amendment would come from your agency as well as other agencies in the state? No, the water, if it's post-1914, the water right, uh, we're, the admin, we're the administrative agency. They would need to apply for an amendment of their water right, and hearings would be held and so forth. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, Michael. I'm just curious about this pre-1914, post-1914. There's the other matter that in California, uh, I guess there's rights to about three times as much water. Yeah. Right. It's such a profound problem. I mean, is it, do you see it as an economics problem or as a problem? Uh, what was the second? Economics or? Is it, is it economics or law? 
Both. Both. I mean, our water ride system is an economic time bomb waiting to explode. I mean, it's, it's the California level equivalent of financial markets, you know? Toxic mortgages. I mean, our water rights system, we spend less than $12 million a year on administering water rights for a trillion and a half dollar economy. And as you point out, the face value of the water rights is three times the physical amount of water. What's going to happen in severe drought? A lot of people are going to go to court. And some people who have possession are going to keep possession unless someone comes out and, you know, the police come out, the highway patrol comes out and shuts them down or something. It's, it's going to be ugly. No, the public interest is not adequately represented. Pardon me? Uh, as supported by my staff, but I have inadequate staff. You know, we don't, we don't have the capacity to represent the public interest in all water rights cases in all situations. You know, I, I didn't say that we have adequately represented the, 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 the public interest in the Delta when I said we're, you know, we've been an aggressive, active board and we're doing the best that we can under the circumstances we operate. I don't think the public interest is adequately being represented. <clears throat> and either someone from the outside has got to put a lot of money into it and bring that representation before us, or we have to have more staff in order to sort out those issues. Because you don't just make those decisions in a vacuum. It isn't the board members, oh, I just make the decision. You have to go through hearings, which take, you know, if you follow the procedures and you, you know, ma you know managing all the motions that occur in a water rights hearing, which I've now done twice, is quite an eye-opener. I mean, it's, it's quite a procedure. The law requires us, and appropriately so, I think, to go through quite a procedure. So it isn't a matter of a board member saying, you know, I want to see the public trust is served in the Delta. Let's go. It'd be 100 days of hearings. And the staff that's required to support that and to get the information and so forth is, is not an adequate supply. So part of what we do as board members is we, ex, you know, we exercise triage. And we haven't yet decided to commence such a, an action in the Delta because we haven't yet seen where that would go or how that would help or how we would do that. Um, but I don't think the public interest is adequately represented, no. Got to have a question that I can give a more positive answer than that to before we leave here. <laughs> um. <laughs> I had a couple of questions that actually um, came in via email um, from uh, Orville Magoon, who uh, was not able to be at the lecture. But he had a couple of questions um, that he wanted to, the answers to. Um, are the potential shifts in rainfall locations in California from cloud seeding covered by your agency? And also, if water were brought into California from, say, Oregon in order to su supply water from Southern California, would your agency have jurisdiction over this imported water? Um, with respect to cloud seeding, no. Okay. We regulate surface water and groundwater in well-defined subterranean streams. Um, with respect to water imported from Oregon, how would it get here? Water bags down the coast? Is Terry Sprague trying, still <laughs> trying to sell his bags right. to people? Sprague's bags, if you haven't heard of him. He can, he can tow water in polyethylene bags behind ocean-going barges. Fresh water. Um, so I don't know how the water would get from Oregon there and as to whether we would regulate it. But we wouldn't regulate it as commerce. Um, uh, we wouldn't regulate the quality of the water because the Department of Public Health does that. Um, if someone wanted to build a pipeline down the length of California, I don't think, if they didn't take any California water, any California surface water or groundwater, I don't think our agency would be involved. I mean, that's an interesting question. So I. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay, are there, is, is there one last question? All right then, thank you very much, Gary. Thank you all.